we had to find product that differentiated from the other products on the market, you know, and that's something that we often talk about that you can't bring the same thing that's selling on Amazon. Too many Amazon sellers fail and we don't want you to be one of them. And I just remember thinking, this is insane. I want to be able to consistently build seven figure brands. My name is Nate Slammons and I'm here with Andy Slammons and it's been a while. It's been, I think, uh, a good 18 to 24 months since we've uh, come on and talked about what we've been up to. Uh, so we have a lot to catch up on, Andy. I think uh, we had 150 or 160 episodes of our podcast that we did at one point and I think we, we would go live talking about what we were doing every week selling on Amazon at some point, either on Facebook or somewhere else. And for the past 18 months, we've been pretty quiet. Uh, and there's a, there's a good reason for that. We've been quiet because we've been busy. We've been busy uh, with our Amazon brands that we've been building and working on and uh, doing over 20 million actually in the past uh, the past two years uh, with our brands. So we actually own a portfolio of brands that does uh, close to 15 million a year in the different services and brands that we work on. Uh, and we've always said this before, but we just you know like to talk and, and help people in getting started in e-commerce and working on e-commerce. But the operation side of things have, have kept us busy in a way where we haven't been talking about it a whole lot. Uh, and, and we're at a place right now, I feel like that we wanted to come out and just say what we've been up to. So Andy, walk us through, I, I just want to hear, it's been so long, like walk us through, uh, like what your thoughts and feelings have been the last couple of years and, and even taking us back further, like what got you to the place, uh, where you were able to, we were able to create, um, an eight figure brand on Amazon or in more than just Amazon and e-commerce and journey. So take us back from your beginning. Yeah, so I'm thinking back to two years ago when uh, you actually came out, you flew out to my house here in Hershey. We did like about two days of recordings. And uh, I remember I built this amazing wood wall that was used as a background. I was super excited because we were going to start to share with folks, you know, what we've been doing the previous six years selling on Amazon and e-commerce. Uh, I know you know, part of both of our journeys early on, we just started putting stuff on YouTube. We started sharing on Facebook and, and it's been amazing to be able to build a great community, you know, just by kind of putting content out on, on the internet, you know, a big proponent of that most people would know his name is Gary V and you and I started doing that early on. And it's really, for me, been super satisfying um, to really establish really deep relationships with a lot of these folks that we've met, you know, on the internet, on the web. And, uh, and so we, we were doing that two years ago, we were, we, we had a plan. And then all of a sudden the brand that you and I were working on, uh, for the previous 18 months, we were laying the foundation, made multiple trips to China. It just really exploded. And I remember, Nate, you came to me and you said, hey, look, you know, we really we have a decision we have to make. You know, do we want to continue to build a service based business, you know, which is very good and is very successful? Or do we want to really go all in on this brand? And, and, and I remember thinking, yeah, wow, we have a tiger by the tail. And so we shelved basically the content that we were putting out and we really went all in on building the brand. And I think, Nate, I, and I think you would agree, that was probably the right move back in. Do you remember when we had that, that talk? It's always scary trying to determine where you should be focusing your time and your energy uh, and continuing to build something you've been working on. But uh, sometimes the vehicle that you're working on, whether that's an investment vehicle or the business vehicle or just the project you're working on, uh, that is more important than what you have been working on in the past, like getting on the right bus when the opportunity is there. And I think that's what we told ourselves was we didn't want to miss this bus. Um, our, our brand really was getting more popular. Our sales were exploding. And with that came just a lot of work that we had to put into 
the brand and what we were working on. And most of that was in the form of hiring people, right? So uh, up until early, uh, late 2019 or so, we were pretty much operating this this brand by ourselves with, I, I think we had one virtual assistant VA at the time that was helping us with uh, customer service and some back end related stuff. But for the most part, it was just us every day. We were talking to the the Chinese suppliers um, from 9 p.m. to midnight our time almost every single day, right? Every single communication of every detail, every um, color that was being suggested or worked on and every um, product description and manual, all that was done by us, every single decision uh, that was at night. And then during the day, we're trying to, you know, even do customer service related things and being in our Amazon account. And uh, I remember setting up our Shopify uh, website at one point, never having done that before. So everything up until then uh, was done by ourselves. And once things started to get really busy, we decided that we needed to, to start hiring people. Uh, and so I think that's been one of the, the things, you know, anybody who uh, manages or leads uh, different, uh, a team knows how much work goes into that. It's not as simple as just hiring someone and then having them run, run the business. And so we actually, as part of the Amazon seller tribe, uh, had a, a program recently called millionaire minds, where we are working with, uh, other, uh, Amazon sellers who are doing at least a million dollars a year in sales. And a big part of that discussion that, that people had questions on, I think was just, hiring and managing their team because most most of these Amazon sellers who are doing at least seven figures have at least some form of employees. It, the, the numbers seem to be typically between two and 10 employees for most people doing a couple million in sales. Uh, and you know that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of management and uh, expertise to kind of lead these teams. And I think that's been a big focus of ours the last couple of years from uh, just just weekly meetings and daily meetings and all teams meetings where we're kind of coming together and casting the vision for our brand and our team, that's taken up a lot of the time. So uh, I, I know that's something that we want to kind of share, like the importance of building a team. And in general, as we talk about how we've been able to build a couple different seven figure brands, you actually exited one of your brands uh, earlier this year in 2021, um, and then now have built a eight figure brand you know, what are some of the timeless principles that we've used since we started selling on Amazon over eight years ago to get to where we're at now and what we think is going to allow us to continue to build other brands in the future and, you know, help pass these along to other people that are looking to do, do that as well. So um, I see we have a couple of people on with us. I see Alpesh, I see Joe, I see Craig. Um, hey guys, hope you're doing well. Uh, and, and these guys have been along with us for most of the journey as well. So, uh, good to see you guys. So Andy, uh, go ahead. Yeah. I, it's interesting. Uh, Craig just uh, put a comment there. Thanks. Craig says lots of wisdom, uh, and integrity, you know, for me, uh, going back to that decision that we, um, purposely made, uh, we had basically two options. Like, where do we want to put our time? Uh, it goes back to the word that he just used, wisdom. And the definition that I often use for the word wisdom is it's the art of making good life choices. And so, you know, for me, like whenever I'm talking to my son, AJ, I'm always my prayer for AJ is more than anything, you know, I don't care what his chosen career is. I don't care, you know, what what he's going to do. All I care about is that he has wisdom because wisdom, you know, for me, again, the definition is the art of making good life choices. And I think what I've realized when it comes to business, you know, and, and I didn't know this, I think going into uh, going back 18 months ago, but success is um, not what it's cracked up to be. It, it, it can be, it's great but it's stressful and it casts a lot of other choices to you that you normally wouldn't have to make. And so for me, like looking back on our journey to growing um, this eight figure brand, there's been a, a lot of 
um, choices that uh, we've had to make, that I've had to make, that I never realized, um, you know, uh, that I would have to make those, even though we've been extremely successful, right? Uh, and so that to me has been an interesting part of the journey. And I remember um, when we were going through the middle of it and the brand was just blowing up and we had all of these different things kind of coming at us. And you and I kind of looked at each other and we were like, wow, we didn't realize, you know, the stress that that success can bring. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was probably one of those days where we were um, working super long hours and uh, had a inevitable problem that came up because that that's the other thing I would say is through success, you have these kind of mini life or business crises that come up that you never would think about before. It's well, I remember Nate, we had one day we sold $360,000. Now, you know, and, and this was in the spring, most people would have been like, man, that's amazing. And you and I were like nervous, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of commitments between customers and, and just everything that's going on to sell that much product in a single day where in the past, uh, you know, I first got started selling on Amazon my first year. Um, selling a decent amount of effort and time. I think I did 250,000 that year, right? So to do that number of, of, of business in a day or, or what we do in a month now uh, definitely comes with requiring the right systems and the right people. Uh, and if you don't like, or as you're building it, it's just stress at first. Uh, and Craig and Craig says success plus stress equals suck stress. I was hoping <laughs> I could say that right. But yeah, is that a Craig, a Craigism? Because I like that. Success. <laughs> so definitely we've experienced a lot of that success stress over the past two years. Anyone, you, you said, so like the wisdom you said, uh, take, take us back like um, two to three years ago when we were first building this brand, just because over the next couple of weeks, I want to lay out like some of the, the decisions and whether you want to call it wisdom or, um, you know, s- smart decisions we've made over the past couple of years. One of the ones that you made was the decision to go to China um, multiple times that you already mentioned. Now, obviously, we're in a different environment now here in in the end of 2021 than maybe we were in the past. But that decision to basically leave your family or leave home for um, two to three week period at a time, multiple times, could you just walk us through like your decision process of why you thought that was the right move at the time? Um, you actually did this before our brand was really doing much or, or before we even got started, actually, I think our first your first trip, we hadn't even started selling anything. So the investment to do that, the decision, um, and what would someone that is either um, starting a new brand today or, uh, or they have recently, but because of all the restrictions going on, haven't been, hasn't been able to make a decision like that. What would your advice be to someone who's looking to Kind of emulate that decision that you made a couple of years ago with traveling to China or traveling to a specific supplier. Yeah, so I think early on, you and I both um, decided that we really didn't need to make a trip overseas. We were able to connect with suppliers through Alibaba, uh, and and you know we we were able to do that um, in, in a uh, a very fruitful way. But at some point, we realized that we had to go and visit other suppliers because uh, things that you search for on Alibaba a lot of times are not going to be what you find right in China. And so um, we had a few products, but we we knew that we needed different iterations Uh, working with the manufacturer online or, um, you know, through WeChat. It just wasn't going to 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 get the job done. And so we made that decision. Well, Hey, let's go to, to, to China to see if we can find some other manufacturers that are going to be um, uh, more willing to work with us basically. So, you know, for folks that are watching, you know, that uh, oftentimes when you're trying to make changes to products and that's what we are trying to do, the manufacturers are very resistant to that. Um, and it's a very difficult and clumsy process. Uh, and so we knew that we had to go there and that's, I think, when we discovered a few products that were, you know, kind of like exactly what we were looking for. But again, like anything, it's never easy. I remember it, I was at the Canton Fair. I'd been there all week uh, looking for this specific product, had walked the floor. We we're averaging between 12 and 14 miles a day, <laughs> you know, walking through these booths. And it's just a massive place. But I remember on the last day I woke up and I'm like, 
you know what? I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to get on that plane and go back to America without having found what we're looking for. And so, you know, I was just determined and walking through all these booths again, looking for a specific product, you know, it'd probably been to 250 booths that manufacturer similar products hadn't found the one that we were looking for. And way, way back in the corner, you know, I'm walking, it's getting toward the end of the day and I go by and I see the exact product that you and I had purposed, you know, for my trip to China, trying to find. And sure enough, it was a smaller manufacturer. And so I spent the rest of the day with him and we still work with that manufacturer today. And they were able to produce the exact product that we were looking for. And so I think that was like a big reason. Like we knew that we had kind of hit a constraint. We had to find product that differentiated from the other products on the market. You know, and that's something that we often talk about that you can't bring the same thing that's selling on Amazon. You know, if you're going to sell a massage gun, if you go on Amazon, you'll see there's 50 pages, right? Of massage guns, you're not going to be successful. So whatever niche you're in, you have to find products that you're going to be able to dif differentiate with. And uh, and I just remember, and I'm probably, I probably texted you right away, like, man, now this trip, you know, which it was a big expense, right? Going there, you know, for me, the biggest expense of traveling always is being away from my family. So that's like when it comes to wisdom again, like I just hate traveling from my family because that's time I'm never going to get back. My kids were young, right? So that's time that you're never going to get back. So that's to me the biggest sacrifice. But then on top of that, there's a you know big monetary expense. But I think you would agree, Nate, like the benefit of finding that product has now outweighed far whatever expense, you know, that we put into it. Yeah. So it's, it's tough in hindsight to say how much of that wisdom was the specific event of going to China versus this just really big investment that you put in to the brand. So almost, almost like saying, I, I feel like we had to tell ourselves like, Hey, this is serious. We're all in on this. We're willing to make this sacrifice. You know, you were there, the the financial sacrifice to spend this much time to do it. It wasn't going to be something that we were just going to kind of give up on or just talk about. We were going to really execute on it. And sometimes it takes that, right? Like putting in like either the purchase amount to like get started with something or the time sacrifice of doing it before you really feel that commitment to like, hey, I have to follow through with this. It can't just be. I mean, we're kind of serial entrepreneurs, I would say at this point, I think we can safely say that over the eight, past eight, nine years, we've built several different brands, businesses. And so one of my biggest problems is probably the, the whole shiny object syndrome of getting on, on one thing and then uh, focusing on another opportunity and another business opportunity. And I think we had, we kind of talked about that being a risk with this brand when we first started that we really wanted to build this to be at the time, I think we said a million dollar business. I, I don't even know if we were thinking big enough to say that we were going to get to be an, uh, an eight figure brand, uh, but we wanted to build a, a seven figure brand at least. And so what would it take to make that commitment? And the trip to China was one of those things that we said, Hey, if we do this, like we're serious, we're locked in. We had to both basically put enough seed money into this new business that we had to, you know, front this expense. So Walk me through like your thought process for someone today, again, just to help people like how we've gone from zero with this brand about three and a half, four years ago to now doing um, over 10 million a year with it. You know, if someone today was looking to be able to, to start a brand like that is one, what type of big decisions would you make in that way of wisdom? Um, and, and with the whole China trip thing, another thing I would ask you on is, about half our products now are actually made in the USA um, or, or sourced here. So if you have any thoughts on that for people like um, buying products or building a brand from products made in China versus US made, and is there any other kind of like bigger starting decisions that you would make if you were building a brand today um, starting from scratch? Yeah, so it, it's interesting thinking about kind of the business mindset evolution uh, that I think you and I both have had over the last eight years. Again, going back to, you know, we started selling on Amazon in 2013 and, and we were basically widget sellers, right? 
we, we were um, we were flipping whatever would bring a profit. And that's a great business. It's a great cash flow coming in. Um, you know, we know that uh, we know a number of sellers that, you know, sell four five, six million dollars a year. And, uh, you know, they make tremendous profit. Uh, and it's a very, very uh, lucrative business. In fact, I, I know one seller, he does over 20 million dollars a year. You know, and, and he flips uh, doing retail arbitrage and, and online arbitrage, you know, and, and he's really making himself uh, rich, you know, from from these flips. But I think you and I, like the progression of our business mindset, all right, probably around three or four years ago, we both realized, well, hey, look, you know, whether it's through reading books or seeing other people in the space, we knew that we had to build equity in a company. Uh, and, and to really grow wealthy, you know, and you talk about this a lot, Nate, you need to become an owner uh, of a business that is going to have some type of, of in value. Right. And so, you know, I think that that was a decision that uh, we started to come to again, three or four years back that, Hey, the real value is owning a business that has value. And again, reselling, this is the way you and I tell everybody who starts on Amazon, to, to, to start out. Like if you want to start out selling an e-commerce, I often say, do it the same way I did. Sell stuff around your house, right? Then move to thrift stores. You know, if you got to use eBay as a sales channel, use eBay, you know, whatever you have to do to bootstrap and then snowball all your profits back in. But the end game then is you want to build your own brand. You want to build your own business because that is going to build value in a company that you own. You are going to have equity, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, for, for you and I, we, we begin to see that. And then that's when three and a half years ago, we said, hey, let's come together. Let's build a brand. And thankfully, again, you know, the stars all aligned and we've been able to do that selling over $20 million now over the last two years. Yeah. So I, yeah, we've talked about this a lot, but when you first start, like you said, we're kind of like self-employed operating everything ourselves. Then we turn into kind of managers where we have a couple of team members. Then you kind of progress to this like CEO level mindset where uh, we're, we're really running full teams and brands. Uh, but then ultimately we've talked about this, getting to that owner level where um, we're really owning this piece of equity that can be um, sold at some point. And I think we've seen that now I think most everybody's, you know, aware of the explosion of the Amazon aggregator market in, in the e-commerce space where you have all these brands who are coming and buying up Amazon brands, essentially. Um, and I think that's going to extend to off Amazon at some point. I believe that the aggregator market or just people recognizing the power of e-commerce is going to extend uh past Amazon into Shopify and in other platforms of just all things owning brands in e-commerce because these, these micro brands, whatever you want to call them, have so much value. And I think it was four or five years ago that you talked about this a lot, Andy, that you talked about that um, up until kind of pre-Amazon days, all you basically had was these giant brands like a PNG or, or, you know, and name any kind of big consumer brand out there that really controlled all the markets because you had to have a certain level of marketing dollars or um, you had to have the ability to go overseas and source products when there wasn't like an Alibaba and there wasn't an Amazon or a Shopify platform. And Amazon really helped to break down the barriers from those those big businesses. So you saw that opportunity, I think. And then we said, yeah, we need to build this, this brand equity. Um, and like you mentioned, we continue to um, support and see the value in other ways to make money on Amazon through cash flow generation strategies. But building this brand is where our focus has been. And then specifically over the last two years, how we've been able to create the systems and hire the right people to do that. So I just want to talk about that for a few minutes here um, before we end, you know, kind of your take on um, if, again, if someone's getting started, like what's the journey of working yourself in the business and and kind of the hiring decisions that come along with it. And if you want to just start with your perspective on it, and then and then I'll give mine. Um, kind of doing some more of the hands-on hiring and in in leading and managing of especially virtual assistant teams, 
which have made up, um, VAs have made up the bulk of our hiring and managing that we've done. But walk me through just your progression that you see of like, when, when should someone be looking to hiring? What are, and what has that, in your eyes, what has that allowed us to do with the brand or the portfolio of brands really that we've been able to create over the past couple of years? <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, when you think about starting a business, you know, for us, again, for me, like I had a full-time job and selling on Amazon was basically a side hustle and it, it grew so rapidly. And you'll hear people talk about this a lot that it, it was costing me money to continue in our full-time job. Uh, it, it, if I would have continued working our full-time job, I would have been making less money than I was, you know, working on Amazon. And so, you know, for folks that are watching this, if you have a full-time job again, and you know, you're interested in selling on Amazon, that's a consideration you might have to make at some point. Uh, I, I know there's a number of people in our partner group, the Amazon seller tribe. Uh, you know, there's one gentleman, he has a full-time job and he sells over a million dollars a year on Amazon. And his question always was, well, look, when can I transition from that? And a number of people would answer, well, Hey, look, you need to look at yourself, your situation and when uh, it is costing you money to stay at your full-time job. That's probably when you need to transition. And so that's like the first question, I think um, a lot of people uh, need to ask themselves, right, as they start. And then the, the second piece of that is when you are in the business or working, um, working in the business, like you and I both did early on, we would have, you know, the product that would go into our garage. We were doing all the taping, all the packing, uh, all the labeling, all the shipping right in and out of Amazon. And at some point you have to put a dollar amount on that. And, and you have to look and say, well, what's the constraint? Well, for me, I could only do so much right by myself. And so I saw early on, Hey, look, if I want to scale and I want to grow, then I need to hire part-time help that are gonna take care of basically the warehouse work because my real value was in identifying and sourcing new product, right? Uh, and so that's where uh, my business was gonna make the money. And, and so, you know, those are just two situations or two examples I can think right off the top of my head that you have to look and say, hey, look, what are the constraints in my business? And for me, I understood that if I wanted to scale and grow, I was going to have to get other people to basically do that warehouse type work, right? Yeah, and, and that was for our brand, like one of our first decisions was basically to, to outsource the 3PL portion of the warehouse and fulfillment of our brand, which you've actually stayed involved in since it's local to you. So you're involved with it, but we're not managing that day to day, like out of our own home operation. So we're not touching the product itself most of the time, although you've unloaded a lot of containers the past two years. I don't even know how many, how many containers do you think you've unloaded? I uh, mean, we've definitely brought in, we've brought in a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we've brought in a lot. You personally, probably 30 containers in the last couple of years that you've unloaded maybe. For so, sure. Yeah, yeah there, there's been a lot of containers. So there, we're still touching it maybe more than some brand owners have, have been able to or figured out how to. Uh, but then, like I said, like our, so we've hired, uh, we've probably hired over 50, 60 virtual assistant team members in the past two years to this brand too. And um, obviously people come and go though as well. So uh, on staff at the moment, we have anywhere between 22 and, and 25 kind of full-time people that are helping. Um, and so that's been a big, a big just deal as well, right? And a big time and energy focus has been leading these people. I, I would say that, um, anybody that knows kind of what we've been doing is in, in the past is I've hired virtual assistants for probably six years now, actually, and, and worked with several VAs, um, several like 200 plus VAs in the past six years. Um, but what was different with the VA team that we are building with this brand specifically was we really wanted to build a team that was like a, a professional level team. And I almost don't even like using the word VA or virtual assistant anymore, because we live in, in just a virtual world now, right? A remote working world. And so a lot of our team members are, I would put them up against any U S person that we've worked with or hired. Right. And so I think I've had a big mind shift, uh, the last couple of years, as far as just like global talent, working with really anybody within our brand, which is really cool that we're able to work with this global talent, uh, but, but at a rate that allows us to scale and build a bigger team than we would be other, 
able to otherwise just for cash flow reasons of, you know, without, without any kind of funding. Um, and, and we can talk about that briefly too, is that, you know, something that I think we're proud of is that we've built this 10 figure or eight figure brand uh, with, with no debt and no outside um, financing, right? We've been able to do it all ourselves, which is, which is hard. And, and that's a big part of it. Like, how do you hire the team if you don't have some kind of um, series A funding of, of, of venture capitalists um, giving you money to like build this out before you're really cash flow positive? Because anybody who's um, building a brand knows that you're typically not making money from day one. And that is the, the difference between like an arbitrage or a wholesale mind, model and, and a, a brand building one is with arbitrage, you are making money from week one, probably, or, or month one, at least. And with a brand, it was a good six to 12 months before we saw any kind of positive profit in the business. And so that's a hard decision to make. And I know you talk about that a lot, just like the, the staying out of debt and how important that is to you. But when it comes to building this team, so these, these 25 uh, VAs that are full-time that, that I want to talk about more, you know, l- later when we have time for it, dedicate like how to do that. But building this world-class, you know, in my mind, team really takes a lot of training and kind of dedicated weekly and, and daily meeting. And I think that was something I didn't appreciate before. I thought I could kind of just hire someone, give them the task and, and check in here and there um, for a few minutes, but not really work on building any kind of like real team or culture, which I know is like a buzzword, but I do think that we've been able to successfully do that. We've built um, an employee team and a, a remote team, which I think is actually even harder, right? Than in person, build a culture where our team members are like really proud to work for um, the company or work with the company. And again, we have a couple of team members who are just superstars and really shine really bright in a way that I would put up against any kind of US talent. And so that's made a big difference because once you do go past, I don't know the dollar amount, but once you start selling a couple million annually or, or a couple hundred thousand a month on average, it gets really, really hard to do everything yourself. And you're doing it at a low quality. I, I look back and I laugh at some of the stuff that we did when we were first getting started, but you got to bootstrap and you got to just do what you have to do. Um, but some of the some of the graphics that I literally made myself or some of the support related questions that we were trying to answer ourselves, it, it, it makes me laugh to go back and see that now because we have like a professional team that handles it in a way that you would expect of a real brand. So that, that's been a big difference too. Yeah. And again, I think it's just a journey. It's a progression, right. Of, of business wisdom that we built up over the last eight years. You know, the famous saying is, yeah, look at my success overnight success when it's really taken eight years, you know, of being faced with numerous decisions. Uh, and you, you know, if you're smart, again, going back to what we started uh, at the beginning of the podcast, the ultimate goal for me in life, as well as my children, is that they are people of wisdom. I want to be in business. I want my business and the decisions I make. I want it to be decisions that are wise. Now, of course, you make mistakes along the way, but every, you know, even minor, major decision, you know, I actually, I I, uh, infuse my faith into it. And, you know, I pray, I say, man, God, help me make this decision. I want to make the right decision. Give me wisdom. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Solomon. Uh, You know, if uh, any of you that are watching, if you read scripture at all, read about Solomon and some of the decisions that he was faced with in the Bible, they place him as the wisest man that ever lived. And for me, living life And then when it comes to business, that's what I want to be about. I want to lead a life of wisdom with my family. I want to lead a life of wisdom with the relationships that I have. And then obviously when it comes to the businesses that we run, I want them always to be infused, right? The decisions we make, I want to have the art of making great decisions and being someone who's wise. Yeah. So just to kind of wrap this up, we, you know, have been, super busy the last two years building this, this 10 million plus dollar eight figure brand. Uh, it's taken a lot of management time. We have gotten to a place where I think we're pretty, you know, excited about where we've created a lot of systems and hired the people where it's, um, there's still a lot of work and involvement. I, I don't want to act like it's a passive income or anything by any means, but where we've, we're, we don't feel like we're kind of drowning in the day to day of operations because of what we've done. Um, so we wanted to talk about that and, and talk about, um, just the excitement and what comes along with building that 
a $10 million brand. And just to wrap this up, walk me through um, before we get more kind of specific and topical, maybe in future talks, but walk me through, what do you see just in, in your own personal outlook for 2022? What is the future of Amazon and e-commerce? Um, what is it now compared to before? And maybe just like as, as people get started building their newer brand, or as we've talked about building um, or starting the next brand, in your mind, what is what is the future, short-term future of Amazon and e-commerce look like? Yeah, I mean, I think we're becoming more and more a, a digital uh, world. You can see that through crypto. You can see that through NFTs. Uh, you know, whether it's good or bad, I don't know. The jury's out on that. But we're becoming and living more and more in a metaverse, right? <laughs> what uh, Zuckerberg has just come out with. And, and that's not going away. It's going to continue to grow. And so when it comes to physical products, when it comes to retail, um, it's not shrinking. It's only going to grow. And, you know, when you have those metaverse goggles on, you're going to be able to see and, you know, test and sample the product that you're looking at in a better way. I think like when it comes to our products, you know, can you imagine, you know, when they have those goggles on and, and they can hold our product and you're just going to get a whole totally different experience. And so, you know, from an e-commerce perspective, it's just going to continue to ramp up uh, because people are going to become just like they have been, you know, during during COVID, they become accustomed, right, to ordering online. And we see that in the warehouses that are being built. And, and you and I know a relative, my brother, who he builds racks, right, in these massive warehouses. And his business is swamped right now because all the goods no longer are going through the middlemen like they used to, right, the distributors, the wholesalers. They go in these massive warehouses and then they go direct to consumer. And so I think a big play is going to continue to grow and it's going to give Amazon some competition. And we can talk about this in future broadcasts. The direct to consumer market, specifically Shopify, has now come in in the last couple of years and they're giving Amazon serious competition. And you and I experienced this in our own brand, right? With the great success that we've had on our own Shopify site. So I think that there's huge opportunity for brands similar to ours, right? To continue to grow their market and compete with Shopify. And I'll end with, with one last thing. And you and I, we, 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 uh, we love Amazon. We know Amazon doesn't love us, right? Amazon is just a platform we use. OK, so, you know, those of you that are watching this, those of you that are listening, you know, understand this. Look, Amazon's a great platform, but I, we want to use Amazon to grow our brand. We don't trust Amazon. We're thankful for Amazon, but that's not the end game. The end game for us is to grow our brand and to get consumer customer information so that, that we can sell directly to them. And this is where Shopify is going to come in. Now, here's what's interesting to me too, Nate, and we can talk about this in future broadcasts. I think Amazon's going to start to get its clock cleaned by these retailers like Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, other localized retailers that have a lot of big footprint in retail, and it, they're going to get their clock clean when it comes to fulfillment. And I'll give one example here as we end. So I had a product that I wanted to order from Amazon. The fulfillment time on Amazon, which we know typically two or three years ago, you could get a, a prime product within two to three days. The fulfillment time on Amazon for this product was seven days. So if I ordered this product on Amazon, it's going to have to wait seven days. I go to Home Depot, and if I'm willing to pay $10 more, I can get it delivered to my home in two hours, right? So because Home Depot has this large footprint, right, they're using drivers similar to Uber. So like if I want to deliver for Home Depot, I could go. I'm not sure what the process is, but, you know, sign up just like a person does for DoorDash or Uber. I can become a Home Depot delivery driver. Well, what a difference. So Amazon now just lost my sale because they can't beat the fulfillment of Home Depot. I can get it from Home Depot, and, and I did. I got it in two hours. So I think there's huge opportunity there, again, for resellers as we begin to expand into these different channels. 
Yeah, and I think that's why we're seeing Amazon kind of look at expanding to their more physical footprints and, and different locations as well. And why we, with our own brand, have tried to diversify into these other channels of distribution where we think there is going to be um, potential to. So in, to, to sum it up, though, uh, still super bullish on all things e-commerce. I think you always said before, the best time to start selling on Amazon or online was 10 years ago. And the second best time is now. Uh, we're still all in on building the brands that we've been building. And uh, we, we kind of have endless ideas of products and brands to bring to market and only so much time and resources and capital to make it happen. So that's where that's where the decision making and wisdom part we have to uh, work on and, and try to focus. Uh, but we are at a point now where, where we're, uh, again, selling consistently this uh, $10 million plus brand and creating the systems and hiring the right people to get that. And we have a portfolio now of brands that do close to 50 million a year. And so we are looking forward to getting back and sharing our story and talking about the principles that have allowed us to have at least some level, slight, even if it's a slight level of success selling online, and we want to help other people uh, do that as well, maybe avoid some of the mistakes. And there's been plenty of them that we've made along the way uh, and talk about just the fun in, in the future of uh, all things Amazon, Shopify, e-commerce as it comes up. So I just wanted to summarize that with this, this short uh, talk about what we've been doing the last couple of years that we are still alive, uh, but we are just busy operating our brand. Uh, and in the future, we'll kind of talk a little more tactical on some of the ways that we've built our brand and, and some of the decisions that we've had to make and we'll continue to make along our journey. So I think that'll do it for now. Andy, thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing. And uh, we'll t catch up soon with the Amazing Freedom community on all things Amazon, e-commerce, and building brands. Thanks. <laughs>